These days, it is very common for employers to hire employees in a state other than the state that they're in or even hire employees in their same state but ask those employees to work remotely from home. Very, very common these days. Now, here at Steadfast, when I started the firm back in 2011, it was a fully remote firm from day one. I started working with clients remotely, whether they were in my hometown or in a different town or another state, and I've been hiring employees that have been working virtual and remote for sometime over five years. So I wanted to come on today to give you some tips on hiring virtual employees and some things that you need to do and look for. So we'll go ahead and dive into those. Hi there, I'm Stephanie Thacker and I'm the founder and CEO of Steadfast Bookkeeping Company and the creator of the Steadfast Method. And I simplify all things bookkeeping and tax for your small business and I help guide busy entrepreneurs on a path to lifelong wealth. All right, before we fully dive into everything that I'm going to talk about today about what you need to know before hiring a virtual employee, I wanted to tell you that I'm going to talk a little bit about employees versus contractors, okay? And I am not going to dive into deep detail about that today, but I wanted to tell you about a really cool on-demand training that I have. It's a completely free training, but I really take a deep dive into contractors versus employees, what the difference is, what the IRS has to say about hiring contractors or employees, plus going through a test where you can tell from the IRS should this person be an employee or a contractor? So I go into a lot of detail. So if that is something that you have already been wondering about, or after watching this video today, you're thinking, hmm, do I need to hire contractors or do I need to hire employees? If that's something that you're wondering about, then you will definitely want to watch that free on-demand training. So I've put the link down in the description below. Like I said, totally free on-demand video that you can watch at your convenience. Watch it in chunks, watch it all at one time. It's less than an hour, um, so you can go through and I have slides and everything that you can even download and keep notes in print, you know, take notes in the PDF, whatever you want to do, but totally free training for you all about employees versus contractors. And so if that's something you're wondering about, definitely check that out and download that information and watch that on-demand training today. Hiring virtual employees has so many benefits. And honestly, these days, I think almost any industry or any business model can adapt to have at least some of its employees be virtual employees, meaning employees that work from home. Whether you are in the place where you're making the shift from in-office employees to work from home employees, or you are looking to hire your first employee and that, that is going to be a virtual employee, I wanted to go over some of the things that you need to know when hiring virtual employees. All right, so first of all, since I am an accountant, of course, first, I'm going to talk about kind of the accounting and tax implications of hiring virtual employees, okay? And the first thing I'm going to say is that you need to know and decide whether or not you are hiring employees or contractors. Now, you just heard me say that I have a completely free on-demand training on that exact topic. So I am not going to dive deep into that, but you will want to know if you need to hire employees or contractors, okay? So if you're wondering about that, watch the training. There is no way that you can walk away from that training without having full clarity on whether you need to be hiring employees or contractors. Once you know whether the individuals that you're hiring are going to be employees or contractors, you'll want to think about the tax implications on hiring those individuals. So for contractors, if you find that you are able to hire a contractor, they do not need to be an employee, they can be a contractor, you probably won't have that many tax implications because when you pay a contractor, you are not responsible for deducting or withholding any type of tax from their pay. So you're able to pay them the full amount and they are responsible 
for their taxes. So when you're paying a contractor, there are definitely less tax implications for you. As a matter of fact, even if you're hiring a contractor in another state, you probably won't have that many tax implications unless it's someone like in a sales role where they are, you know, going out hitting the ground in that state, so to speak, and they are really bringing in business in that state. If that's the case, then you'll want to talk to your CPA about what your specific tax implications might be. For the most part, and I say for the most part because it's always a good idea to talk to your CPA about it. Every state can be a little different, but for the most part, if you are hiring some type of, you know, administrative or skilled professional as a contractor to do work for you in your business or to do work for your clients, then you probably will not have many tax implications. The biggest thing I can say with that is that you will want to pay them consistently. And what I mean by that is, well, obviously pay them consistently on what you agreed to, but pay them the same way from the start to the finish, right? So it's not really good practice to send a PayPal payment one time and then send Venmo and then send Cash App and then write a check and you know do all of these things. That's not best practice. Best practice when you hire that contractor is to pay one way. Now, in reality, and you would find this out by watching my free training, that contractor should be invoicing you and they should have a way for you to pay. They should say, this is my PayPal to send the payment to, or this is where you can click to pay the invoice, or you can mail a check to this address, right? So the contractor should be billing you for the services that they have provided, okay? Again, go watch that free on-demand training. If you still have questions, come back here and I'll be happy to answer those questions, but I can pretty much guarantee you that most, if not all of your questions on that will be answered, okay? But keep that payment consistent with how you are paying them. Keep that payment method consistent. And then make sure that you file a 1099 for that individual at the end of the year, okay? So again, talk to your CPA about that because there are definitely some things where, you know, depending on how you pay them and all of that, maybe you don't have to file a 1099, maybe you don't need to issue a 1099 to that individual, but that would be one of the biggest tax implications that you would have, is to make sure that you are documenting what you've paid them, you can show how much you've paid them every month, every week, periodically, whatever that looked like, and then you can document that and issue a 1099 to that individual. If you are hiring an employee, a W-2 employee, and they are in another state, of course you're going to have a little bit more of a process and a little bit more tax implications, okay? So as you may or may not know, when you hire a W-2 employee, you are now responsible as the employer to withhold taxes from their paycheck. At minimum, those are going to be their federal taxes, right? Federal withholding, Social Security, Medicare, all of those things. And then if they live in a state that has state income tax, you'll be required to withhold their state income tax as well. And then sometimes there's county or district taxes or other little things like that that you will need to withhold from their paycheck and then remit to those certain agencies. So that is definitely one thing when you're hiring employees out of state, you know, like for me, I live in Florida, we don't have income tax. So if I were to hire just all employees in Florida, it would be a little bit easier, but I actually have employees that work in all different states in the U S a lot of different states. And so, you know, there's a little bit more of a process that I go through when I hire those employees. So, and I know that in advance, right? So that's something that you really want to look at and consider when you are hiring a W2 employee, you're going to need to do those things. Well, what does that mean? That means that you're going to have to register for payroll withholding in that state. You're going to have to get certain account numbers and some states will even require you to register with their secretary of state or to now file some sort of income tax return. They might have an annual franchise tax that you have to pay. Some of them might even require you to actually register as a business in that state Literally every state is different and can require different things. So if you are hiring a W-2 employee in another state, don't let that you know turn you off. Maybe just talk to your CPA or a tax professional and ask them. 
most CPAs will probably say, you know, here are some states that are kind of the hardest to deal with, especially if you're not in that state. Maybe they require a lot of registrations or they require a lot of tax returns or things like that. Or if you have an employee in mind in a certain state, maybe you can just say, hey, I'm thinking about hiring an employee in Texas. What is that going to mean for me? What do I need to do? Your CPA should be able to tell you exactly what payroll registrations you need to file, you know, if you need to do a franchise tax return, if you need to file certain tax returns and all of those things. So keep that in mind for W-2 employees. There are, there's going to be a little bit more work upfront and then maybe even ongoing for you as the employer. And the last thing that I wanna mention that kind of goes along the lines of accounting and all of that is payroll. So obviously if you are hiring W-2 employees, you wanna have a really good payroll system in place and one that allows direct deposit, okay? So especially if you are going from in-house employees and now you're branching out to virtual employees, just remember, you are not going to be able to, to just pass out paychecks on Fridays, right? You're not going to be able to run payroll, print checks or hand rate checks, and then hand those checks out. You are going to need to find a way to pay your employees. And the most, like the easiest way to do that and the most efficient way to do that is just going to be direct deposit. That way checks do not have to be mailed and you know, you're risking the chance of losing a check in the mail or whatever. So definitely find a payroll processor that you can process payroll in multiple states and that will allow for direct deposit, which is almost any payroll processor these days, honestly. But if you want my opinion on the easiest and best payroll provider for small businesses, check out my video on Gusto and how to run payroll in 2021 and beyond. I'll put the link for that here and probably even a little box up here somewhere. If you want to watch that video all about Gusto payroll, check that out. And you'll hear me mention in that video if you watch it, but I'll mention it here as well. The link that I'll put down below in the description box for Gusto, which is a payroll provider, it's all online, it's cloud-based. One of the things that I love about them is that they reward you for doing your first payroll, which is so cool. So if you use that link that I put down below, it is a referral link for me, but what's really cool is that for you, they're gonna send you a Visa gift card to your email just for running your first payroll. So when you sign up, you know, you'll have a couple of things to get in order, and then after you run that first payroll, they're gonna send you a congratulations, and it's going to be at least a hundred dollar Visa gift card that you can then go and use however you need or want to. So love Gusto. If that is something that you're needing to get in place, um, you can definitely run payroll for all of the states. You can do direct deposit there. You can set up withholding. There are so many things that you can do in Gusto. If you are looking to hire virtual employees, there is no better option in my opinion than Gusto. So I would definitely check that out if I was you. And then I think I said payroll was last but then I just thought of one other thing. Of course, you cannot run payroll and have employees or really even contractors for that matter without having a good bookkeeping system in place, okay? So you are going to want to track all of these payments that you're making as you are branching out into hiring virtual employees. So make sure that you have a good bookkeeping system in place. Make sure that you are using a good bookkeeping software or that you've outsourced to a good bookkeeper who can track all of this stuff for you. Because, you know, especially when you start hiring employees, you know, again, if, if you've just been used to contractors and you've been able to just write a check or send a payment and never worry about taxes, you know, it, it kind of levels up a little bit when you hire W-2 employees, because like I said, you're withholding taxes. And so you need to be recording those things in your bookkeeping as you know a liability and then you're paying that liability off you need to re be recording those correctly so make sure that you have a really good bookkeeping system in place before you go out and hire these employees or contractors so that you can make sure you are tracking everything accurately
All right, so now on to some other things that I've had to consider when hiring virtual employees beyond the taxes, the payroll, the accounting and bookkeeping and all of those things that I just mentioned. Now, these things that I'm going to go over are things, again, that I've learned just from hiring virtual employees over the last few years. And I really think that putting these things into practice and thinking through some of these things can really be a game changer for you and for the employee. And a lot of these kind of take place in that kind of interview process or when you're kind of um, filtering through candidates. So keep that in mind. Um, but I really do think and hope that these things will help you. All right, so first of all, one of the first things that I could kind of recommend to you is that when you are interviewing candidates for a virtual position, make sure that you ask them about their experience working as a virtual employee or working from home or working independently, you know, without a supervisor or a boss over their shoulder, okay? Now, if someone doesn't have experience, I'm not saying that you just immediately discount them and move on to someone else. That's not the case at all, but you will definitely want to ask about their experience. And, you know, ask them, how do you like working from home versus working in an office? Do you like working independently? You know, do you do you feel motivated when you get up in the morning to go to your office, turn on your computer and get to working? All of those things, you are going to want to see and hear the responses. You know, if you're doing a Zoom interview or something, you know, ask those questions. They might feel like hard questions. It might feel like you're prying too much, but you'll want to know the answers to that because you're going to want to have somebody working for you that is able to work independently. You want to have somebody that is motivated to do the work on their own, that's motivated to do the work. Because let me tell you, working from home, there are all the distractions, am I right? There could be kids at home, there could be spouses at home, there could be neighbors knocking on the door, Amazon deliveries coming, laundry piled up that needs to be done, dinner that needs to be made, cleaning up around the house in general, just all the things, right? And especially when you don't have anybody, you know, looking over your shoulder, if you don't have a supervisor walking by, it might be a little easier to just pull up Facebook or have Netflix playing in the background. So you need someone who's motivated to shut all of the distractions down and really focus on work when it actually is time to work. And then beyond that, you really want to have someone that's okay working by themselves, okay? Again, I have I've worked from home for 10 plus years now um, by myself. Don't have anybody working here with me. This is my home office. All of our steadfast team members work remotely. You know, even if they're in the same town as me, they're working remotely from their home office. So do you hear what I hear? Yeah complete silence, right? You have to be okay with working in silence. If you're somebody that like thrives off of you know, just the chatter in the background and the phone ringing and the copier going in the background and all of those things, they're probably not going to be the best virtual employee, right? They're gonna hear a lot of that. Nothing, <laughs> okay? If you are interviewing a candidate that has not worked from home before, ask those hard questions, ask those questions, see what their responses are. It is going to make all the difference in the world and it's going to save you as the employer from making the wrong hire, right? Because you might have, and trust me, I have been there where you have an amazing candidate. They check all of the boxes except one except being able to work independently, you know, or except being able to work from home. I've been there where I've had amazing candidates, but they have kind of with the prompt of my questions been like, you know, I don't know. I, I, it's actually going to be a challenge for me to work by myself at home because I actually really thrive. I get my energy from being around people. If I have someone like that, you know, that's tough because I know that they're going to be working home alone or the only chatter they might hear is their kids in the background or the neighbor's lawnmower or something. Ask those things and make sure that they are comfortable working independently and alone from home. All right, another tip that I have and something that I've learned is definitely make sure that you are doing interviews on video, okay? Everybody at this point knows how to use Zoom or Google Meet or something like that. So use a video interview for sure. Now, if you have a lot of candidates and you're trying to kind of wean them out, maybe you do a phone interview first and then you do your final three on Zoom or something, that's fine. 
but make sure when it comes down to those final candidates, make sure that you are seeing their face at least on video. And I have found this to be so, so important because I really like to see how candidates show up to the interview, especially if they are going to be interacting with your clients or other team members. If you are going to want them to show up to video meetings with the team or with clients or with vendors and look professional, then you wanna make sure that they're showing up that way to an interview, okay? Personally, for me, if someone shows up to an interview and you know I'm here in my office, it's quiet, I don't have anybody home, I have put away all distractions, and then somebody shows up and they're like in their car in a parking lot and they just are using their cell phone and it's all shaky the whole time and you know all I hear is like you know that noise <laughs> the whole time it's really distracting or if somebody shows up and it looks like they just like got done laying out at the pool or they just jumped out of bed um, those types of things I really look for just to be honest with you because I want my candidates to show up to the interview just like they would if they were meeting me in person, right? I want to see that they have a professional looking environment around them and they don't have to have a dedicated home office that's all nice and neat. Maybe they just have a corner in their bedroom or a corner in their dining room or their living room. You know, I don't I don't care if I'm seeing a bookshelf of books in the back or, you know, a TV that's turned off in the back or a couch in the back. That doesn't bother me so much as I just want to make sure that it is really a professional looking environment, right? That it's not a bed with like 20 loads of laundry on it, or it's not a sink with like stacked up dishes. You know, you wanna make sure that it's a professional looking environment. So make sure that you're interviewing on video. Plus, it's just good to see people's faces. It's good to get that face-to-face -face interaction. And you know, that's probably the most interaction that you're going to get until you do get the ability to meet them in person. So do as much video interaction as you can and you know it truly will help another thing I have to say about that is if an interview you know if you do an interview and the person interviewing shows up and they're at a coffee shop and they like have earbuds in and they're trying to listen to you the whole time for me I'd be able, I would just be on the lookout for that you know because everybody knows that a coffee shop is going to be loud right you have conversations going on you hear cash registers you hear crinkling of paper you hear coffee beans being grinded like you hear all the things. Coffee shop working is fun sometimes, right? Especially if you or the candidate are that person that kind of thrives from the noise and the environment. Like there are definitely some, some times that you can go to a coffee shop and just, you know, dig your heels in and get work done. An interview is probably not the time for that. You would maybe want to kind of look out for those things when you are interviewing, you know, did they make it a priority to make their environment a good one? Did they make a priority to, you know, be in an environment that you as the employer, you as the interviewer are going to know that, hey, if I'm your employee, I'm going to make sure that when I'm representing you and your business, I'm going to be professional. I'm going to be dressed professional. I'm going to look professional. Uh, my environment is going to be professional. You want to know all of those things up front. So I cannot stress it enough. Do a video interview, check their surroundings and ask, you know, hey, do you have reliable internet? And you can tell those things if, if they're at home. You know, is it constantly going in, in and out? And you can say, do you have a reliable computer? Do you have a reliable printer? Whatever they might be using, you know, how is your internet? All of those things. Do a video interview so that you can kind of test all of those things in advance. Okay, another thing that I would recommend is as you are in that process of interviewing candidates, I would find a couple of things to maybe email your candidates about, right? Because if, especially if they are going to be in a position where they are emailing your clients, your customers, vendors, your team members, whatever it is, if you are wanting that employee to be communicating with people professionally through email, go ahead and email them a couple of times throughout the process and see how they respond. You know, look for things like how quickly do they respond? How is their grammar? Do they answer all of the questions that you're asking them? Those types of things, because here at Steadfast, a lot of our employees interact with our clients via email 
a lot, you know, all day, every day. It's very important. That's something that I definitely look for. I wanna see, how do you email? Is it professional? Did it take you two hours or two days to respond to me? You know, test those things out as you're going through the interview process because those things, you know, sometimes are harder to train. Another thing is just making sure that they kind of can use email <laughs> software, right? So you might wanna ask those questions, you know, are you proficient in whatever email you're using, Gmail, Outlook, you know, whatever that's going to look like for them specifically. They are going to be communicating with team members, vendors, customers, or all of those things, then you wanna make sure that they're able to respond efficiently, professionally, and that they're not going to be held up by you know email software technology. All right, my last thing that you should know when hiring a virtual employee is that it will be very important to use some type of online communication tool to create a water cooler talk area. And what I mean by that is think of it when you're working in an office, right? There's usually a break room or somewhere where people tend to run into each other and kind of talk about, Hey, how was your weekend? You know, Monday mornings, there's a lot of that. How was your weekend? What did you do? How did this work out? You know, whatever. And Fridays, there might be a lot of, Hey, what are your plans for this weekend? And you know, Oh, I'm really looking forward to this, you know, all of those types of things. And when you're working virtually, you don't have that opportunity as much because you're not passing each other in hallways. You're not look, you know, passing each other at the break room or looking across the table, you know, eating lunch, talking to somebody. So it's really important to create a space where your employees can still remember that they are part of a team and it's okay to talk about things other than work sometimes. Here at Steadfast, we use Slack and it's just an internal communication tool. And first and foremost, we use that for kind of quicker responses within our team. So we email a lot, but we email a lot with our clients as well. And sometimes we just need quicker responses, right? Sometimes it's just like a really quick question that another team member can give a quick yes or no answer to, things like that. So we use Slack for that. But what's cool is that we also have channels that are like random and general where you can just pop in you know things about your life and share with the team we might put in there something about you know what's coming up for the weekend maybe we'll put pictures of our kids on their first day or pictures of our kids at halloween or you know talk about you know hey i'm going through this in life right now like have you been through that does anyone have any tips does anyone have any recommendations or just as simple as how was your weekend opening up those channels on a you know internal communication tool like slack makes it really easy for everyone to remember that they are a part of a team. Make it known that it's okay from time to time to talk about those things. It doesn't have to be work 24 seven. You know, after all, this is a team and this is your team and you want them to work together. You want them to truly become a team and part of that is getting to know each other on a personal level and not just work. So I would highly, highly recommend that you, you know, have some type of tool like that where your employees feel comfortable going and creating that space and being open and talking with their other um, you know teammates about just general life things and a little bonus tip too to that is that if you can I would highly recommend getting your team together in person at least once per year so here at steadfast we have an annual retreat and we've been doing it for the past few years and just kind of choosing a central location and going and yes we do some like trainings and updates on things in the business but we also do super fun activities like kayaking or like riding bikes to a restaurant or clay shooting we did one time other than last year where we did a virtual retreat every year we're getting together in person and every single employee is invited to come to that retreat we actually shut down work for two or three days and we really focus on the team and team building and improving systems and talking through processes and all those things and so ours is actually coming up at the end of september and i really hope to do a, a video on that and a recap on that so if you any questions specific about that let me know in the comments below and I'll be sure to address those when I make that video but that's kind of a bonus tip for you is not only do you want to 
create that internal communication where you can have daily communication with team members, but also create a time where you can all get together at least once a year and see each other face to face, actually meet each other in person, get beyond the screen and beyond the keyboard and just talk and do real life things and work on the business together. It is game changing and I will go into more detail about that in my team retreat video that I do, but I can tell you that we always walk away from those retreats closer, more motivated to work, motivated to serve our clients even better, and it has been really, really great for our team here at Steadfast. All right, so that's all I have for you today as far as things that you should know when hiring virtual employees, but I would love to know if you have any other tips. Have you hired virtual employees before? Let me know down in the comments below if these tips were helpful or if you wanna share any other tips with anybody else, things that have helped you. We would love to hear that, so go ahead and put that down there in the comments. Also, don't forget to subscribe to my channel because I do release new videos every week and I cannot wait to see you next time.